What's going on guys? So look, if you're watching this video right now, it probably means you're already an audiophile, or at least you're somebody who's passionate about music and how you experience that music. And I totally get where you're coming from because I've been that way for the better part of 20 years now. I've gone through a lot of stuff and the whole reason why I'm creating this video is I want to share some of the things that I've learned in my journey. I want to tell you all about the things that you can do to really maximize the performance and really your overall experience with the stereo system that you have at home. Now a lot of these tips are going to be geared towards people who are kind of new to this hobby and I'm going to be speaking strictly about two channel stereo listening and that's because quite frankly when it comes to headphones and home theater gear there's people out there who know more than I do so that's going to be the main focus and clearly as always some of these tips are going to be things that many of you already know about but the hope is that by the end of this video I'm going to have something to offer most people so with that said let's get right to it all right, so the first thing that I wanna to talk to you about is speaker positioning. Because for those of you who are fortunate enough to be able to have a little bit of room to play with, a lot of you ask me, hey Sean, I got these speakers. Where do you think they should go in my room? Now, what I tell everybody is the best place to start is by finding what I call the voice of neutrality. Now, this isn't something that I made up. Actually, it was a technique developed by David Wilson who passed it on to me, and now I'm passing it on to you guys. And I found it's a really good starting point. It's not gonna be probably where you're gonna ultimately end up, but I think it's a good place to start and then you can kind of tweak thereafter. And this is how it works. Basically, you're trying to find the space in your room that sounds the most natural with your own voice. And what you wanna do is, let's say you already have the spot picked out where you want your stereo system. It's gonna be against this wall right here. Well, what you wanna do is you wanna actually stand, like physically stand with your back against the wall and just start speaking. And what you're doing is you're using your own voice as a guide because you're so familiar with it. What you wanna do is you wanna start speaking and listen to the sound of your voice. When you're against the wall, it's probably gonna have a lot of reflection. It's probably gonna sound overly chesty and just not very natural. So what you wanna do is you wanna just keep talking, step forward, gradually and just listen to the tone of your voice and what you're going to find is as you start stepping out into the room it's going to sound a little bit more natural a little bit more natural and what's going to happen is at some point you're going to take a step and you're going to notice that whoa my voice just got very echoey kind of bright sounding and that's basically when you know that okay you clearly have gone just a little bit too far, take another step back, and you're gonna notice that it should all come together and your voice should sound pretty natural in the spot just before basically it all goes haywire. Now that ideally is where you want to put your speakers, specifically the front of your speakers. Now clearly this isn't going to work for everybody, but I've found that, again, this is a really good starting point. And usually that's where your speakers are going to sound the most natural is where your own voice sounds the most natural. Again, it's not foolproof, but it is a good place to start. So now let's move on. All right, so the next tip is huge. And honestly, it's a mistake that I've seen tons of people make to include people who've been in this business for a very long time. And that is a lot of people like to set up their stereo system so everything looks perfectly symmetrical, right down to the millimeter. And this is often not the way to get good sound in your room. And here's why. Think of it like this. Think of a loudspeaker in your room. You have the left and right speaker. Well, most of our rooms aren't ideal, right? In fact, usually they're pretty horrible from an acoustic standpoint. You might have a room that opens up to one space or maybe it's closed in or maybe you have furniture here on this wall but not on this wall. And basically it's a cluster for most of us. And because of that, that means your left and right speaker is going to be loading the room differently with sound. Meaning that by the time it arrives to your ears, it's not going to be even. So when you have this perfect symmetrical setup to where the speakers are perfectly lined up against the other speaker and you can almost draw a straight line to it, well, that usually results in uneven sound. In fact, in my own room, on the left side of my stereo system, I usually have to pull one speaker about an inch and a half to sometimes even two inches in front of the other to really get a nice centered image and for everything to sound balanced. Don't be afraid to do this. If you're having a lot of trouble getting a center image, and if you're having a lot of trouble of just getting good sound, oftentimes it means forgoing your OCD notions of having this perfectly symmetrical setup because usually due to how sound loads a room, it's not gonna work out too well for you. So if you're having issues, just bear in mind, it's okay for it to look just a little bit imperfect. And unless there's something extreme going on, odds are you probably won't even notice it when you're sitting down in your listening position. So uh, yeah, something to think about. 
All right, so on the topic of loudspeaker positioning, one of the things that I'll do to fine tune a system is to use a good mono recording. Because with a mono recording, you have the same information playing from both speakers. So if you have everything set up right, then you're gonna hear this really good locked in center image. Everything's gonna sound balanced and you know you're on the right track. Whereas with a stereo recording, you'll have the engineers having sound going from one speaker to the next. And honestly, it can be confusing and isn't really a good reference point unless you're really, really familiar with the music. Now, the music that I use is gonna be Masterpieces by Duke Ellington. This is actually gonna be an analog production hybrid SACD. It's not a cheap disc. It usually sells for around 29 bucks, but I like it because there's some tracks on here that I really enjoy. And I've found that using real music is a little bit better for me than using like a test CD that tests phase and polarity and all that. Because after all, we're listening to actual music and not noises and or somebody just saying right, left. So uh, anyways, that's just what I do. And now let's move on to the next tip. Okay, so the next thing is something that I admit I didn't even consider up until maybe four or five years ago, and that is experimenting around with the position of your listening chair. Now, not all of us are going to be able to do this, and quite frankly, I didn't think of it until one day I had somebody over who was listening to my system, and they said, you know what, Sean? They were sitting back to where I normally put my head, and they're like, I get what you're going for here, but... When I put my head forward like this, the sound is just brighter and livelier, and I think I prefer it that way. And I was like, you know what? Let me move the chair forward. I sat down, and I was like, I get where you're coming from. I mean, I don't like that kind of sound, but it made me realize the importance of where your listening chair is in relation to your speakers. And a lot of people talk about this perfect triangle, and I've come to find that uh, that doesn't always apply. I think it's best to just use your ears and use your own frame of reference in terms of what you like or not, and to just experiment around just a couple inches forward or backwards can actually make a pretty big difference and best of all doing this only takes a little bit of time and it's free so try it out okay so now let's talk about room treatment guys I can't tell you how important this is I've beaten this drum in the past and I'm not gonna stop because it's really important most of what you hear in any listening environment is reflection and that has a huge influence over the sound of your stereo system. Now, I realize that not all of us can put panels in our room and put stuff on the walls. I get that. But if you have the ability to do so and you love your stereo system, then freaking do it. It's one of the best investments you'll ever make. For less than $200, you can get three panels from a mature company that's going to do a great job of really just taming those reflections in your room. In fact, the best thing to do is to tame first reflection points. Now, I'm going to have a link down in the description box so you can do some more reading on that. This is a long video as is, so I can't really go into detail here. But honestly, get some panels from somebody, DIY them. There's plenty of recipes out there. And if you have hardwood floors, get some kind of carpet or something in there between yourself and the speakers that can really tame those reflection points. The difference that it can make for your overall listening experience is huge. Guys, it really is important if you can tame the space. All right, so this one goes out to those of you who use bookshelf loudspeakers because I want to emphasize the importance of pairing up your bookshelf loudspeaker to a good stand. It doesn't matter if you're using them in a traditional hi-fi setup or if you're using them in a desktop environment. The same thing holds true regardless because when you get right down to it, a loudspeaker is a mechanical object. You have air being moved throughout the cabinet that's creating energy and resonance, and it's really important to tether it to a good foundation. That way, that energy can be released in a very controlled way. Way. Now, obviously, you don't have to spend a hell of a lot of money to get good stands. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a link down in the description box to a bunch of stands that I would recommend. But by and large, I would say the Pangea Heavy Duty DS 200s or 400s, whatever they're called, with maybe $10 worth of dry playground sand is going to be good enough for most people. And for desktop users, ISO Acoustics has some for affordable stuff that's not too bad. Now, my favorite stands are going to be from TriArt Audio. I like low mass stands for reasons that I'm not going to get into in this video but the whole point is use good stands don't cheap out on them because that's going to have a huge impact over what you hear anyways now let's move on to the floor standers all right so when it comes to floor standing loudspeakers the same principles generally apply i mean it's the same physics going on which means what you tether that speaker to in terms of decoupling it from the floor is going to have a pretty big impact over what you hear now i've messed around by putting speakers on top of slabs of marble and wood but really and truly for most people you just need to use good spikes now in my experience some of the best performing spikes that won't break the bank are made of brass and you can get those off ebay so i won't even bother putting links 
links in the description box because obviously there's style concerns, size concerns, etc., etc. But I would emphasize the use of something like brass spikes if you really want to get solid performance out of your floor standing loudspeakers. Usually it's worth a try. All right, so on the topic of resonance control and dissipating energy and all that good stuff, I think this is a good moment to talk about the importance of isolating certain components from vibration. And I'm gonna focus strictly on mechanical objects like say a CD player or a turntable. So this goes out to those of you who are having issues with maybe your CD skipping when somebody walks by it or maybe your turntable just can't keep the uh, needle on the cartridge because again, of vibrations. Basically, you want to isolate it. Now there's a lot of things you can do, some people go the cheap route they don't care about how it looks and they'll just get like say some foam pads that you'd normally use for shipping cartons and put it like say in between the turntable and the foundation some people will go and buy basically like rubber pucks that you can put underneath these objects in the ideal world springs are actually the best way to isolate a turntable from its actual foundation, but usually it doesn't look very good, which is why most people don't do it. If you want more of an audiophile solution, I'll have some products linked down below that I'm in no way affiliated with. That's just stuff that I've experimented with, and it tends to work for me pretty well. But if you're having issues with your mechanical sources, then yes, it's gonna be important to make sure that it's more or less isolated from severe vibrations from whatever foundation you're using. And also it might be a sign that it's time to use just a better equipment rack as well. So anyways, it's important to mention, something to be aware of, and now let's move on to the next tip. All right, so next, let's talk about power. And no, I'm not talking about power conditioners, and instead, I'm talking about having a dedicated AC line for your stereo system. Because most of us, if you haven't done this already, our line is gonna be shared with other outlets in the house that may be used by other objects. And the whole idea here is to have an electrician come out and to run a cable directly from whatever outlet you use for your stereo system all the way to your breaker box. That way you have access to clean power. So this is gonna cost you around $500 in the United States. Obviously the price is gonna vary depending on where you are and how complex it'll be for the electrician to get the job done. But honestly, this is definitely gonna be worthwhile, especially to people who use big, powerful amplifiers. So yeah, definitely something to consider. All right guys, so we've made it to the end and the last subject that I wanna briefly go over is polarity. Now polarity is actually a pretty complex subject and I don't wanna to get too bogged down into details. So all I wanna do is say this, go to the back of your speakers and you know how you have the positive connected to the positive terminal and the negative connected to the negative? Reverse it, you're not gonna cause any harm, just reverse it, sit down and listen and see what you think. And I say that because there's a lot of components that are actually wired out of polarity. Now, I don't know if this is on accident or on purpose, but I've found this to be the case well, more often than you would think. So sit down, listen to it, and if you like it, cool, keep it that way. But if you don't like it, then cool, just go back and reverse things to how they were and enjoy your system. Anyways, guys, that's it for now. Hopefully I'll come up with some more videos like this in the future because actually I like making them. But nonetheless, hopefully somebody has gotten something useful out of this. And that's it for me, at least for today. So as always, thanks for watching and until next time, peace.